yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fed with the church right, of right, time. Right. Alright, so today we're talking about query scheduling. So how do we take the the, the tasks uh, that we've generated for our query query plan and start distributing amongst the, amongst the workers to, to execute them, produce results? Um, Again, just a reminder for the last class, we were talking about processing models. And we said that the vectorized model is, probably, it, it, sorry, is the best approach for running analytical workloads because it's, instead of, it has lower overhead of having called next, next, next. Uh, and so we get a batch of tuples, but it's not all the tuples that you see in the materialized model. And then as far as I know, the, the top to bottom approach, the pull, sorry, the push base, there should be a push, not pull. The push base approach for query execution in the vectorized model that, that we see in hyper uh, is, is going to be the better approach. I, ha I don't know actually whether, whether there's research based on this. Um, but this, this, this is sort of the general conventional wisdom right now. So I showed this before, uh, last class as well. Like this is, our, this is sort of the, the, the model of how we're going to break things up and what we're going to execute. So again, a query plan is going to be this direct acyclic graph on which these, these operators. Then we'll have different operator instances that will be the invocation of, of one of these operators to execute on some piece of work. Again, in the Morsels paper you guys read, all right, each invocation of, of, the, of, of, a, of a task on a morsel, those are executing operator instances. All right, so again, the task would be one or more of these operator uh, instances to put together in, uh, in a pipeline. And then the task set now is going to be the collection of executable tasks uh, for a logical pipeline. So you can sort of think of like, you take the, the, the query pen like this, you define the pipelines based on the, the, the boundaries for the pipeline breakers, and then now you have a bunch of these tasks that are going to do that work on dis, uh, dis, uh, distinct chunks of data or morsels or whatever you want to call them, blocks. And this is what we need to schedule and, and execute today. Okay. So for each query plan, the data system has to decide basically where, when, and how it wants, wants to execute it. Right? And this is going to be there's a bunch of different design changes we have to make, like how, sh how fine grained should we break up the tasks for our, our query plan? Um, how many CPU cores should we use for executing them? Um, and then which, of those, which CPU cores we sh should be using? And again, in the case of the morsel paper, as we see, that was an in-memory system. So they're assuming the data is entirely in memory. For this lecture, we're going uh, to ignore reading things from disk and assume that the data is already gotten in memory because something else is already figured out. This is what I'm going to execute and dispatches it. But we still need to care about where the data is actually residing in memory when, when we go uh, assign our task to execute things. And then after the task does the, whatever computation it, it was meant to do, it produces some output. Where do we put that output? Because yeah, that's going to depend on who's actually going to end, end up reading it. So the, this is a great example. Uh, and I don't know how much this was emphasized in the Morsels paper, but the follow-up paper one at the, from Umbra, from, from the same team, you know, they make a big deal that, like, these are all the decisions that we want to make in runtime inside our database system. And this is not something we can let the operating system figure out for us. Right? The operating system is not our friend. It, it's always going to get in the way. And so we don't try to avoid it much as possible. So that means we want to do all the scheduling and data placement and all these things manually inside our database system. Because if we let the OS do it, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're going to have a bad time. Right? Think about it. If I'm executing a query plan, I know, it, I, you know I, I have these tasks, I have these task sets, and these tasks are producing results, and I know who's going to read that result. So I know where to go place it and where the next task go read it from, or where that, ta that next task would read it from. The operating system simply can't know these things. The like, Your statement is, is this because the operating system is too general? Yes. And database systems are the most important application class of all, all computing uh, from, from since the beginning of time. Uh, I'm highly biased, but like we're just one from like you know from the Linux people's perspective, we're one of you know hundreds of different things that could run. Uh, we're the most important. Again, I'm biased, but uh, so they try to be general purpose. Um, and there's certain uh, design decisions that we'll make in, the, in their own scheduler. Is you know is, is going to be not optimal for database system. This has been well known since the 80s. There's a paper from Mike Snowbreaker from like 1980 talks about how the OS is basically your enemy, and this this continues. All right, so in our scheduling algorithm and scheduling methods, we have four goals. 
So the most obvious one is that we want to maximize throughput. We want to maximize the number of completed queries that we can push through the system in a certain amount of time for our given resources. Right? That's, that's sort of a no-brainer. We also need to be mindful of fairness, um, meaning that we want to ensure that no query is going to be starred for, for resources. Meaning, like, if there's a really long-running query that eats up all the, all the cores, and that's going to block a bunch of the shorter-running queries that may be behind it, and this, this system is going to look unre unresponsive during this. Related to this, I mean, basically the same thing. Like, if we, uh, if we don't ensure the sort of fair uh, allocation of resources so that nobody gets starved, this is going to ensure that the system is going to seem more responsive because our tail latency is going to be much lower. So I guess the way to think about this is like, if I make the, if I have a really long running query, uh, if I can sh use some of the resources that instead of for that long running query for other short running queries, the short running queries are going to definitely notice that they got the result back right away. But if the long running query takes another you know, 10 seconds to run, but it's already ran for five minutes, no one's going to notice or care. So we, so we won't see this so much in morsels, but we'll see this in the HANA paper and then the Umbra paper where they can kind of still take advantage or still they allow the, the faster short running queries to, to get, you know, get results more quickly. And then lastly, sort of obvious as well, is that since we're not letting the operating system do any of this, we have to implement all this in our data system ourselves, then we don't want to have to have this very expensive scheduling process or mechanism where it takes a long time and threads have to block because of updating global data structures to figure out what things to run next. So we want our threads, our worker threads, to be spending more time executing queries rather than trying to figure out what queries to execute or what tasks to execute. All right. All right, so for today's class, we're going to first talk, talk about worker allocation. We're going to not spend a lot of time, or not really talk about the process model too much, just to say like it's, it's multi-threaded. Uh, we can make that assumption going forward, although Postgres does not. Then we'll talk about data placement policies, how to decide actually where do we want to store memory, uh, sorry, store chunks of data in memory, and then why that matters for modern CPU architectures. And then we'll finish up talking about, about four different schedule implementations, the Morsels paper from Hyper you guys read, the follow-up to that in Umbra, HANA, and then a little bit of SQL OS from SQL Server at the end. Okay? As I said, for this discussion today, we're going to ignore disk. We're going we're gonna to assume that when a task gets assigned to start running, the data that it wants to read is in memory. And obviously, in a, uh, you know, in a cloud system, a disk-based system, that's not always the case. But you know, just assume that something else has got prepared getting things in memory for us ahead of time. All right? Okay. So in the undergrad class, we spent time talking about the, what a process model is. Uh, so this is just a reminder to say you know, what that is and understand the, the, how that's going to relate to the things when we talk about scheduling. Um, so the process model is going to define what the underlying system architecture looks like in terms of uh, supporting multiple queries and multiple resources, or mu basically multiple CPUs. Right? You could have a your process per, per worker, or you could have a, you know, a thread per worker. right? And I'm, I'm trying to use the worker as much as possible during this lecture, but I've already slipped up and I said worker thread. Right? You just think of like the worker is some, uh, some resource that can execute task, ex execute machine code for us, like a process or, or a thread. So all the things we'll talk about today, it's actually not going to matter whether it's a process-based worker or a thread-based worker. But for all the systems, for the most part, we'll talk about the semester, just assume that they're threads. Like, there isn't a... Nobody's building a modern OLAP data system today using the process model. Everyone is using threads, unless you fork Postgres, which a lot of systems do. But uh, you know, think like Redshift. I think when they fork Postgres, or they, they're based on Power Excel, they've gotten rid of the process model, and it's all th multi-threading now. But any system that's based on Postgres without making major changes is 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 going uh, to be using process. For whatever reason, 2016, I had a student, my, my first PhD student. We took Postgres, we forked it like everyone else, and then we switched it to be multi-threaded uh, instead of being process model. Um, I forget why we did that, uh, but it turns out the way we did this is like we actually leveraged the, the Windows-specific code, like the Win32 code. You can use that to convert it to be multi-threaded multi instead of using the, the Unix stuff that's inside of it. There's a bunch of pound of finds in, in, the, in the source code. It says, here's, the Windows, you know, here's Windows, Windows process model stuff, here's Linux process modeling stuff. If you start with the Windows one, you can convert it to uh, P threads more easily. We also converted the C11. Again, I don't remember why we did this. Um, it was the early days. Things are wild. Um, 
Anyway, so again, the worker is going to be the thing that actually can execute stuff for us. So the, what today is about is figuring out, we have a bunch of these workers, what should they be doing? And how should they find out what they should be doing? So the, if we want to allocate these workers, we've got to say how many workers we actually want to have. So the two basic approaches is to want to have one worker per core or multiple workers per core. And in the Morsels paper you guys read, they were using the top one. A lot of systems are using this, um, just because it's, it's simpler to reason about. Uh, you some cases also too, you would you actually turn off hyperthreading, like you want to have like sort of a single for a single physical core, you only have one worker. Um, hyperthreading can help if you're if you're disk bound in some cases, but that's not us for this. So what we're going to do is again for for the first case, we're going to have a for each CPU core, we're going to have a thread that'll be or worker pinned to that. Uh, we pin to that core exclusively by the OS, meaning the, the OS scheduler will not allow any other thread um, within our process, and within our database system, to, to run on that, on that core. It can run like kthreads or other random stuff, but like within, uh, unless you try to turn off everything, which I don't think you can for the, within kernel threads, like you can't, you know, within a database system, we know that one worker is only going to run on one core at, at this location. Multiple workers per core would allow us to have a pool of workers, either per core or per socket. Um, and the idea here is that the operating system is going to have a bunch of uh, cores, or, I'm sorry, a bunch of worker threads that could run. So if, in the case that one of them gets blocked on like you know, mutex down in the OS, it can then schedule another uh, worker thread or process to execute. Right? Um, HANA is going to do this, and we'll see this in. Uh, how they're going to support this, because they're going to have a bunch of pools, and they're actually going to keep track of who's allowed to run uh, at any given time. So it's, again, it's basically re-implementing what the OS is going to do, us, do could do for you, but inside, inside, entirely inside the database system. But again, for the Morsels paper, you know, this is this is the one. Uh, this is this is what we're going to assume. And this this syscall here is basically how you control tell Linux, I want my thread to run on this at this CPU core and nowhere else. All right, so the next question is, how do they find out what tests should they execute? And just like, uh, you know, just like before with, with the processing model stuff, there's a push and a pool-based approach. So in the push-based approach, there's a centralized component, a dispatcher or scheduler, that knows what, what workers it has, knows what they're doing at any given time, and then when a worker says, uh, when it, it knows that a worker is free, it then pushes the task to that worker and say, please go run this. Right, and then when it's done, it gets a response a result back, and the work, and then the, the scheduler say, okay, here's the next thing you should run. In a pool-based approach, the there's some global queue or some some global data structures that have the available tasks that could run, and then it's up for the the each of the workers to go look in this thing and say, what, what should I run next? And you can partition it maybe like per socket you have a bunch of tasks, and then maybe there's, there's a task queue, and there's a global task queue. And maybe check your local queue first, and then if not, go check another queue. Again, we'll see this in the HANA case. Or it could be a, a, a single queue, like in the case of the Morsels paper. All right? All right. Nothing should here should be that exotic. All right, so regardless now of how we're going to assign workers to, to cores and how they're going to find out what tasks that they should execute, then we need to also be aware of for the data that they're going to, going to, they're going to process in their, when they execute that task, where is that data located relative to where the worker is located? Again, assuming that we can either assign a worker to either a single core exclusively or within a, a, a group of cores, like on a single socket, the data is also going to be somewhere as well. And we need to make sure that ideally workers are always accessing data that's local to its, to its location, to, to its CPU socket. Right, so I don't have what other classes cover. How much do they cover NUMA versus uh, the uniform memory access? So this get a quick crash course on like what CPU architectures look like relative with, with different kind of memory layouts, and then we'll see why we want our database system and how we can we can make sure that uh, we minimize the the traffic across CPUs. So back in the day, uh, the old way of doing multi-socket CPUs uh, was, was using an approach called uniform memory access. Sometimes called symmetric multiprocess uh, architectures, SMP, right? Think of like 90s, early 2000s. And so in this case here, what you would have is a bunch of these different CPU sockets. 
they would each have their local like L1, L2, L3 caches. And then they had this system bus where it, th this was sort of the gateway to a bunch of memory. Again, think of, it's all on a single motherboard. We're not going over the network here. But the idea is that if I'm over here and I want to get I'm running a worker on this, uh, this socket over here, and I want to get da data over that memory, I just go up to my, uh, you know, make, make a load or store address call into my system bus, and this thing is responsible for routing things to, to the right location. So in this environment, the, there is no notion of local memory for the sockets, meaning the cost of reading memory from this, this DIM to, versus that DIM is the same. So there's nothing really to optimize in the system because everything costs, costs the same. Of course, I'm, I'm, this is like, I'm glossing over a lot of details. Of course, now if, I'm, if I, I do a bunch of reads, uh, sorry, different, different sockets read the same thing. They all have it in their caches. So then if someone does a store on, on a cache line or, or updates that piece of memory, the system bus has to make sure it does the cache invalidation to make sure everything's all synchronized. Like x86 does a, is very aggressive to make sure everything always has a consistent view. We can ignore all that for this. Just the main thing is like, if I go access memory to any DIM up there, its cost is always going to be the same. So in modern systems, they use a different approach called NUMA, non-uniform memory access. And the idea here is that every socket now still has its own local L1, L2, 3 cache, but it's also going to have local DIMs, a local memory. So the cost of read, for this socket here to read some, some chunk of memory over here is going to be way faster than reading from uh, a remote NUMA region, right? Like 2x, like, like pretty, pretty significant. Now, we're talking at the nanosecond scale, but still 2x is, is, a, is, is quite, a, quite a lot. And so the way this works is that now if I need to go read this socket, a worker running this socket needs to read memory from over here, I have to go to this interconnect on the motherboard, then send the message up to here and say, go get the memory I need, and then bring it back. And again, the motherboard is still responsible for figuring out like, who has what cache lines for what pieces of memory. So if there's an update, now I have to do a cache invalidation across all the sockets that may have that, may have a copy of that in our caches. Right? It's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very complicated, very interesting. Um, but again, the only thing we care about, because we're not doing transactions, we're not worried about updates, we only care about what, you know, the data we want to read, we just need to know that if the memory's here, it's going to be way faster than the memory's over there. So this interconnect has a bunch of different names. Intel used to call it the Quick QPI, Quick Path Interconnect. Then they upgraded it to Ultra Path Inter Interconnect in 2017. And then uh, AMD calls theirs the Infinity Fabric. Right? And the bandwidth is, is quite high. It's like you know, the gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes. It's, it, um, but again, the latency of, of the local memory versus remote memory is, is quite a lot. Right? Yes? His question is, do, you, do I have to go send a request to the actual core to get a piece of memory, or can I go get, go get directly get the memory? Actually, I don't know. I think you just go to the memory. So it's like, direct, it's direct, like DMA, direct memory access to go. Yeah. You don't have to go to the core. You don't have to use the core itself. But you still got to go over this thing. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. But not utilize the core itself. Yeah. OK. All right, so now let's go back to databases. So, this is going to make our system development more tricky now because before with, with this one, I call malloc. I don't really care where it actually is because the cost is always going to be the same. But in this world, if I call malloc, and it always comes back with our memory address, where, where is it actually being you know, stored? right? Because now, again, because it can matter because now if I start ripping through in my, my task, scanning some data that's, that's in memory, uh, if, if I'm going over the interconnect every single time, now it's not going to be on, on a burp pipe basis, but it's going to get, get things in, in sort of cache line chunks. Still, that's going to be 2x slower than reading it locally here. All right, so we want to be able to control exactly in our database system where this memory is being allocated, and then we know where our workers are running. So now we ensure that if we assign a task to a worker, make sure it's a task that's going to be in its local memory. And we can schedule that accordingly. All right. So the database system is basically going to partition memory uh, for a database using, you know, and assign a partition of memory to, to the CPU. Uh, and because we can control exactly where this memory is being located, and we can control what things we want to schedule at different cores, uh, we, again, as I said, we can make sure that the, 
the data we want to read is, is, is going to be local, ideally. In some cases, it won't, it won't always, be, always be the case. So this is an old problem in databases, especially in distributed databases. It's called data placement. Right? Think of like the partitioning problem is, is, is how do I take my table, pick some attribute, and then slice it up into horizontal chunks or shards and put that on different machines. The data placement problem says what chunk goes in what machine. Right? So again, we're not a distributed system. We're running on the same box, but we st it's essentially the same problem. So we can rely on the syscalls like move pages or the command line uh, program Numa Control. This allows us to specify the policies for how the data systems process will, will decide where, where memory is going to be located. Because right? we can have complete control exactly uh, of all of this. Like the OS will actually expose this to you in the hardware. All right, so quick question would be, if I call malloc in our database system, what happens? Assume there's no, assume the, the, assume our allocator doesn't have a bunch of, in a bunch of memory in user space, right? Because they, they maintain their own cache as well. Assume we have to go to the OS and get memory. What happens? Yeah, he says, he says S break, yes. Well, that's later, right? Initially, almost nothing, right? Well, the allocator will extend the process data segment with S break, but then this is going to be virtual memory that's actually not backed by physical memory, right? It's just like a promise. The OS is like, oh, yeah, I got some, here's a memory address. Uh, it's virtual memory, but it's only when you actually do anything with it, then it, there's a page fault, and then it actually tries to back it with physical memory, right? So then the question is, uh, if, if now I try to access this memory I just got back, where is it actually going to be located? Cannot be controlled. He says it cannot be controlled. Mm -hmm. One choice. Depends on which thread you choose from. Like, is the thread is simply the core, so it's kind of allocated to its new model for memory? So, so it's when, sorry, it's which thread what, sorry? Yes. So depending on whatever thread the OS picks, the OS the thread would prefer to pick memory that's local to it. Uh, so, so you ignoring what thread we're so I think you're basically saying whatever the first thread that touches it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's that's one of the policies. Yes. So by default, you get interleaving. Uh, we just say it just allocates it uniformly across memory across all CPUs. And hopefully it works out, right? And what he was referring to is a specific uh, mode you can put in, uh, you can run your process, which is called first touch. So you have one thread, some other NUMA region, allocate memory. It's virtual memory. It's not backed by physical memory yet. But then when another thread then touches it, then where that thread is running, whatever NUMA region that, that, that it's pinned at, that's where the, thing gets, the, the memory actually gets allocated, right? Once things are actually already allocated, you can move stuff. Uh, like going back here, like this move pages uh, syscall, you can either, if you give it a memory address, it'll pass back, hey, here's the new region where this chunk of memory is in. Uh, or you can say, here's a memory address, and here's the length of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the stride or chunk, and then here's the new region I want you to put it in. Right, so you, you, can have pretty fun, you can have very fine control over all these things. Right? So this is an old experiment uh, that a student's run a long time ago uh, on a machine here, the PDL, that had eight sockets. So we, we wanted to test this out. But it's a really simple execution engine, similar to what you guys are building in Project 1, where it just allocated a bunch of memory and then just did a sequential scan through it. right? And so uh, this thing has eight sockets, two, two cores per socket, with then, then, sorry, 10 cores per, per socket, and then pl plus hyperthreading. And so the. The red line, so the, the, the black line here is you just let the OS figure out where to put stuff, like using the random policy. And then the, the red line is with we, we ensure that the, the thread that's going to read a chunk of memory is reading memory that's local to it. And then along the, uh, the x axis, you're scaling up the number of, of threads. And so you see here, what is this? Uh, triple thread per second. It's, it's, it's almost double, it is double the performance by, by only reading local memory. Yes? Why does it? So the question is, why does it increase, increase in the beginning and then it stabilizes? 
because at this point, I think in the beginning, there's fewer threads, and therefore the probability uh, there's fewer threads, but you have to still read the same amount of memory. So the probability that a thread is reading data that's local to it is higher because each thread is just reading more things, re reading more tuples. Then after that, it's. it's Doesn't the probability not change because it's still going to randomly pick from any of the other threads? Like, Doesn't the probability. There is only like 80 crossing tokens, so whenever there is 80 threads, the performance will not be better. Wait, sorry, did you say, repeat that again? Sorry. Um, I said there are 80 crossing tokens. In total, 8 buckets, 10 cross per node. So if there are, there are 80 threads. Yes, that, that's. Oh, that's oh, that's hyperthreading. That's you're talking about this line here, this demarcation here. Yeah. Yeah. That that that's not his. Yeah, we'll get there. His question is why in the beginning are they basically the same? And I'm saying that the 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 probability that the thread's going to read data that's local to it is increases because it's reading more data. Whereas like it's randomly placed, it just happened to be. Read data that like could be local to, local local to you. Isn't it just that there's less threads? I don't know. Uh, so like, I guess like the performance isn't like as. I mean, there's more of a chance that they would read like stuff in like a different thread. I don't know. Yeah. It, or like a different like or further away. Just yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. Uh, my question was when you say that then we need to put, are they all, and you can all be coding just one node, one local node, a plain one. And they're, they're randomly distributed. They are randomly distributed. Yes. When you have a local partition on the RD, just in one partition. Say so again, if you, the local partition one. The random partition is when the data is distributed across all the nodes, right? It's randomly distributed. Yes. No, random would be, so local partition would be, I break it up into uh, to so many chunks of partitions, and then I make sure that each thread that's going to scan it only reads data that's in its numeric region that's, that's local to it. Uh, when you say cache all the data, what do you mean cache? Yes, so you're, so you're paying the, the. For one thread, it doesn't matter whether it's random partition or local partition. Correct, yes. Because like I'm, I'm, my thread is running on, on, on it's pinned to this, this, this core. The data I need is, is at the other room regions. I got to bring it over the interconnect to get it to, to scan it. So there won't be such a gap in just one thread. Correct, and it is, but yeah. same, yes. All right. So the other thing he brought up too is this, I had this demarcation line here to say this is when hyperthreading kicks in because this is 80, 80 cores. So after that, now you're getting to, to, to the logical threads. With, uh, Intel calls them hyperthreading. And in this case here, because we are, we're bottlenecked on memory bandwidth uh, in both cases, this is why it plateaus. So this is what I was saying before that, that oftentimes for OLAP systems, you actually want to turn off hyperthreading because it's actually not going to help you and it's just, it's just going to get in the way. And give you a false sense of uh, of parallelism uh, or additional resources that you actually don't actually have, right? They're all waiting for cache line fills because they have they're trying to read something. It's not in the, not in their cache. Then it's got to go out and get it from memory. And if it's going over to interconnect or whether it's local, it's, you still have to stall while you go fill it fill in your cache line. Then it can run. So it doesn't matter that you have additional hyperthread on a core that. Because they're both be waiting for the cache line fill, and that that's why you plateau. Again, this this experiment is probably five or six years old. Uh, we can I don't I don't have access to another eight socket machine. I don't know whether uh, how much better it would have gotten. I still suspect you would see the same plateauing effect. But maybe because if the interconnect got faster uh, with UltraPath the over QPI, the the difference between the two would go down. Okay, so I've already said this, uh, the partition scheme versus placement scheme, so we don't spend too much time on this. Partition scheme, we've already talked about this, how, how to decide to break the, the table up into horizontal chunks, and the placement just says, where should we put it? 
and then the default will be round robin. Uh, but the better approach is to interleave it across cores, and, the, and then the the data system will be aware that this chunk of memory is is, is located in in this numa region. Again, in the Morsels paper, it's actually the, the, the memory is actually the, the table itself because it's the in-memory database system. But if you're reading a bunch of parquet files or org files or whatever coming, coming off the network of, over S3 or whatever distributed file system, that's got to go into memory somewhere as you start reading it, and you want to put it in memory where you know tests will be able to run locally on it. All right, so, so far we have the test assignment model. We have the data placement policy. Again, it'd be, be NUMA aware. Um, so now the question is, how do we take a bunch of tasks from a, from a logical query plan or physical query plan and then distribute them into task sets and then assign them to workers that actually run? In the OLTB world, this is easy because there usually is not, there's only one pipeline, typically. Like it's going to be you know, do an index scan to get Andy's account and maybe do a projection or something on it. So it's, it's one, one pipeline, it's one task. You just you just assign that to a, to a, a, a worker and, and be done with it. In OLAP queries, it's going to be more complicated because we have to worry about dependencies between these tasks or these pipelines. And then there's going to be a lot more instances of tasks or within, a, within a task set for a pipeline. So there's way more things we actually need, need to run. So the, the naive approach is just call it static scheduling. And this is where we, the database systems are going to figure out at the time it generates the query plan, how many threads or how many tasks should, should I have for my query? And then I just dispatch it and I'm done. I don't change based on the uh, based on resources. I don't change based on what other queries are running. Right? It's the easiest thing to do because I just say, all right, I have the same number of tasks as number of cores. Assume that the tasks within my task set for a pipeline are all going to run the same 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 amount of time, and I just shove those out and I'm done. And I can do a really simple first come first serve policy where the priority in which queries get execute depends on the, the at what time they showed up to the system. Like, that's like that's the most naive thing to do, right? The challenge, of course, is like this won't work in a uh, in an operating environment in a system where there's a uh, there's a bunch of other queries running or showing up, where now I could have contention on those resources, and I don't want to. Uh, and I don't want to starve them. I want to make sure I have, I have to have those goals in mind that I talked about in the beginning, right? So dynamic scheduling is what we're going to do instead, where we're going to want to be able to uh, decide on the fly which, on the fly, how to assign tasks to workers uh, to, based on what, what, what's available, what resources are available, and also based on where the data they want to process is located. So this is what the morsel-driven scheduling approach, the paper you guys read, is about. So the term morsels, uh, this, is a, this is a hyper term. This, this is something that they invented. I don't know of any other system except for maybe DuckDB, which uses this approach, uh, is going to refer to data this way. But basically, they didn't, they didn't want to use the term block or partition. They had to come up with something else to say, here's a piece of data. So they called it morsels. right? So it's slightly bigger than a block, but smaller than a partition. And I think in, I don't know what they said in this paper, but it's, it's like 100,000 tuples. Right? It's, it's based on the number of tuples. Uh, or a morsel is defined to a fixed number of tuples. Anyone have even sized morsels for a table? So it, you're going to have one worker per core, and they're going to pin it uh, to, you know, to the core so that only that worker can run to that core. You have one mor morsel per task. Um, you'll do a pool based assignment where the workers are going to go look in a queue. And try to figure out what's the next thing I should run, um, and they're just going to round robin data placement for, uh, for for the tables. And again, this is an MRA database. They're not bringing in parquet files and disk. Umbra does that. Actually, supports disk, but they, in their, that the newer scheduling paper for Umbra, which is a, the precursor or, or sorry, the successor to, to Hyper, they want to support reading data from disk, but they, their scheduling paper ignores disk entirely. As I said, we, we we'll just do the same thing. So all the operators are going to have uh, sort of parallel NumaWare implementations of them. They're going to be a push-based approach. They're also going to do query compilation, which we'll see in two classes, of how, but how they sort of define what these tasks are. Uh, but we can ignore that for now. Yes? Isn't the dispatcher assigning tasks? Shouldn't it be push-based tasks? Uh, the workers have to go look in the queues and figure out what to do. 
I'll have to go, I mean, I'll, I'll have to double check the paper. But I thought they, would, they, they go check queues and they can do work stealing. That's only if they're idle. There's measure pushes then? I said it does both. Okay. Actually, no, I don't think there's a, there is a, there isn't a dispatcher thread in Morsels. No, there's no dispatcher. The dispatcher is like a lock where you like give, like give Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and sorry. Then, like copy code and then you like implement it inside. Like the code is like ran inside of the thread that like asks the dispatcher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm not crazy. Yeah, sorry. So, yes. Yeah, so it is, it's a pool-based approach. Yeah, there is no separate thread uh, that figures out what's going on. HANA will have that. They'll have a watchdog thread. Uh, but even then, they're still pulling uh, from queues. But there isn't anything that, like, giving you do this, you do that. To her point, they copy the code. It's uh, the code, like, in the code you would have to, it's not like copying code. It's just. It's, they execute the same function call to say, what should that next thing they do? And everyone executes the same function call. But they're aware of what, what queues are they reading from and pulling from. It's a global data structure. They, that's what I, so in this paper, they say, oh, yeah, it's a global data structure. It's a lock-free hash table. They don't want to say how it's actually implemented. And they claim it's not going to be, a, they don't talk about being a bottleneck. But in the follow-up paper we'll briefly cover after this, they avoid this. And they, they specifically come up with a, uh, a queue, uh, a, a, a global queue that doesn't have that same hash table it, because it is a bottleneck at, at, at their scale, at larger scales. OK, yes. All right, so no dispatcher thread because um, they're, they're using a pool model. And then the, all, all the, the workers are going to be looking in a, in a global queue to figure out what's the next thing they need to do. And the threads are going to have logic that's going to, uh, uh, where they're going to choose or prefer to take tasks that are in or that's going to operate on data that's local to its NUMA region. But in the case that things aren't available in their, in their, in, for its local NUMA region, they can go ahead and steal tasks that would normally be used in another, you know, in, at a worker overlaying in another NUMA region, right? So there's a cooperative scheduling where everyone's working together in unison to make sure that, uh, that things are actually getting executed, getting, getting done, right? So again, as I said, the paper ignores the synchronization calls to the global hash table. But then they'll, they'll fix that in, in, in the Umbra paper after this, right? All right, so here's our data table. Uh, and we want to do this, this you know, simple join like this. So again, the morsels are just going to be some, some artificial boundaries of 100,000 tuples or whatever the number you want it to be to say, here's the, here's the different chunks of data. But again, they call them morsels. And in their case, it's 100,000 tuples. When we started building our own system here in, in Peloton, we did 1,000 tuples. In HStore, we did, uh, which is an earlier system I built, we did, we did 10 megabytes. These are arbitrary numbers we just picked. Um, I think they claimed they did some benchmarking locally, uh, profiling to decide why they came up with 100,000. But again, Umbra will get rid of that. Um, when we were building Noise Page, it was an in-memory system as well, we were doing uh, one megabyte uh, morsels because we wanted to do uh, we want, we, don't, we want to be aligned at 20-bit offsets for addresses because there was a trick you can do in C++ to make, to reduce the size of, of, an, of a pointer to some memory chunk if everything's aligned along that, along that size. But we, we can ignore that. All right, so, all right, so then we have these different morsels, and we're going to assign them to uh, these different sockets. So now when we want to execute, uh, start executing a query, right, the first thing to point out is that here's all the morsels that these uh, these CPC, or these sockets of these workers are are responsible for that they know about. They're also going to have a chunk of memory that's going to be local to 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 it. That's going to be in its own NUMA region. That's going to be where it's going to store intermediate results, right? or the output of a, of, a, of a task has to go somewhere. So they want to write it back to, uh, to locally. And the idea here is that because now I I'm going to operate on data that's in my my local uh, NUMA region. Then I don't have to go to the interconnect when I read from it. And then when I produce output, I'm going to write it back to my NUMA region because the next task I'm going to read, or the next task I'm going to execute, is then going to read that, that, that data I just outputted. And if it's in my, in my same NUMA region, then I'm, I'm going to be fast because I take my output and then read it back into the next task. And it's, it's all local to my, my NUMA region. All right, so there's also uh, this internal metadata we're maintaining, I'm not showing here. We, we know the dependency for these pipelines or these tasks. So in this case here, I know I have to build the hash table 
uh, on, the, on, the, on the build side of this join, I have to scan A and then build the hash table. Once I have that done, then I can do the probe with B. So there's, again, there's a metadata that keeps track of, I can't run anything for uh, uh, the second head task set until the first one is done, right? So in this case here, say this task set for the first, through the build the hash table, it's evenly divided across the different buffer size, or the morsel sizes. So I will have each of these threads, uh, each of these tasks run in parallel at the same time, right? So they read their local data uh, to build the hash table, and, and then they write it back out. I assume in this case that we're just doing partition hash table. It just, for illustration purposes, it doesn't matter. But now in this case here, say the, uh, the first two workers are done, the third one's not done yet, these guys have to stall in this case here, assuming there's no other queries to, to run anything, because we know we can't execute anything in, uh, in, in the next, next task set for this pipeline because we have to wait till the hash table, you know, all the hash tables are done, so we don't have any false, false negatives. All right, so when that's complete, then we go start executing the next one. Again, all these now run in parallel. Uh, say this one guy finishes, then it goes up in this, this global task queue, and it can pick another task to run. And in this case here, if there's no uh, task that, that prefers or wants to run on this NUMA region, like say this, this nest task will pull it out, wants to run over here, because this guy's still running, and because there's nothing else to do, it can go ahead and, and poach it, steal it, and actually run it as well. And maybe this task has to read data that's, that's, that's over here. So that's OK, right? And then it, in this case here, it just writes, it, writes its output to its, its local buffer. Right? OK. Um, yes? So what happens in the case where, like, in this exact example, right, if, like, we'll just call it, like, like one runs faster than, like, or like one runs slower than if three would have like done two tasks. Like, is there a case like that because of their reading from like memory that's in a different like new region? So her statement is, uh, or question is, in my example here, this guy was idle, so he says, okay, well I'm just going to steal something and we start running this next task. Could it be the case where we were actually better off letting this guy be idle because? because it's going to have to go over the interconnect to get this data, that it's better off just let this one finish and then, then go get the next task that it wants to execute and operate locally. So we'll see this when we talk about HANA. They claim you, never, you don't want to do this at large, large SOC accounts. Um, that it, this actually makes things worse, exactly as you said. And I think for the, 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 paper, the Morse paper, I think they run up to four sockets. The HANA paper is running up to like 64 sockets, oh. like these massive machines. And in that environment, it's just, it's just the cost of going over the interconnect is so expensive. Just don't do any work soon. OK. So again, the reason why they have to do work stealing is because there's going to be only one worker per core and one morsel per task. So if, if all the threads are, have to, are just sitting waiting for the, the stragglers before I can execute the next, the next, uh, you know, the, the next set of tasks, then they argue, again, it's better off to go ahead and, and, and try to execute something speculatively, or not speculatively, try to execute something even though it's going to interconnect, because that's better than, than being idle, right? As I said, and they maintain this, this lock-free hash table to keep track of what should they actually execute. So, yes? So your statement is, they're basically implementing out-of-order execution from a CPU. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I said the word speculative, and I shouldn't have done that. Speculative makes it sound like, like the CPU. It's not speculative. But no, not speculative. But they have a dependency checker, which makes sure that only the ones that have a dependency, which have the dependency satisfaction until the queue. And then they just take an instruction from that and put it onto the sum execution, which is the worker thread. Right. So, so your statement is, because we have this dependency graph, we know that what pipelines depend on the output of another pipeline, that we know what tasks are available to run right now. So if we have, if we're idle, go take something that we can run it safe. Right. Yes? I mean, that's how we do it. Our work should be also done something. It's not, it has a right, but, the, but. I mean, something similar yeah. to that. It's not yes, exactly. it's not, yeah, without the speculative part, yes, it, it is the same. Um, In fact, I think they can do speculative execution for something because they know it's going to happen. 
they can at least do speculative uh, memory loading or speculative disk loading for certain things. Yeah, so, so we're not talking about, yeah, we, so we, we're ignoring d disk dispatches, but yes, you, you would say these are the things that are coming up. Let me go ahead and fetch the disk. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole other beast. Um, in terms of speculative execution, you can't, I think whether this is true or not, you don't want to speculate execute any tasks in an OLAP query because they said, like, if the hash table is not fully built yet, and I start probing it before it's fully built, then I can end up with false results, right? So it's hard. I think it's harder to speculate execution in an OLAP system. Yeah, in an OLTB system, if you're doing store procedures where you have transactions that have multiple queries, uh, as long as the output of one query doesn't doesn't depend on the 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 input of one query depends on the output of another query. You can do speculative execution, even though the the program might be written in a sort of serial procedural manner. Um, there is work on that, and like, or like I, it's sort of like optimistic control. Like I assume I'm not gonna have any problems. Let me go to execute these things, and then I check at the end whether that that was okay. You can't do that in OLAP because again, the because I mean, yeah. it's it's driven by the data. Okay, so. In, in, in this paper you guys read, there's sort of two big issues that come up that they don't discuss, but then it's shown up in the, in the, in the follow-up paper. And that is the, the, they, you know, the morsels are fixed size. And the t one task correspond to, corresponds to one morsel. And so they assume that the execution cost per tuple is going to be the same across different morsels, uh, or even within the same morsel within different query plans. Meaning, like, if I want to do a scan a table, and I have a where clause and the predicate, there's one, and they're operating the same morsels, and one predicate is like where a equals one, right? But another predicate might be like a regular expression comparison or evaluation on, on a string data. That regular expression would be way more expensive. So the cost of looking at every single tuple is going to be way higher than in the other one. But they, they can't account for that because this, the the because everything is based on these morsels, and that's the rigid definition of of a, of a unit of work within a task. Uh, you can't have, uh, you can't, how do I say this? You can't, you can't change other scheduling decisions based on how much time you're spending, which is actually the really thing you want, you care about if you want to have, you know, fairness and responsiveness. So you want to be able to say, this thing's going to take a long time. Let me go ahead and let a shorter run query run for a bit. Uh, I can't do that if it's, if it's, if the morsel size is fixed because I got to finish the morsel before I go to the next thing. Right, and then related to that, of course, again, now you don't have a. Uh, ah, this is finished, but all query tasks are executed with the same priority, right? If I have long-running queries, they're going to get blocked. So I don't have all the slides I want to show for 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 the Umbra scheduling approach. Uh, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give a high level flavor how, how what it looks like. So in this world, it's still going to be morsels, but now a task is not going to be. Um, Restricted to, to be one morsel, it can be one or more, and and then instead their notion of a chunk of data. Yeah, just close the door. That guy's on the phone. Yeah, he's like he's he's wearing shades and like sorry. Anyway, anyway, um, yeah. So 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 the now what's going to happen is the notion of a of a computational unit is going to be based on time. Like like up to one millisecond. So the idea is that if I have multiple morsels, uh, you know, if I, I'm given a, given a morsel to operate on, but I complete it within under, you know, just, you know, microseconds, I can go back and get, get the next morsel to execute without having to go get rescheduled for the next task. And this ensures that now you're, you're, you're sort of operating things deterministically on a, on a time-based schedule rather than like a database schedule, right? The other thing I also have too is they're going to support priority decay, meaning uh, when a query shows up, it's given the highest priority, right? Because I assume it's going to be short. But then if it keeps running over time, it takes longer and longer, then its priority decays exponentially. And that means that it's less likely going to get scheduled. It's still going to be able to get to operate and get things done to process data. But now if short queries show up, they'll have that higher priority, and then they'll get the run complete very, very quickly. So again, this ensures that the, the system seems very responsive, and short-running queries finish quickly, because uh, otherwise people complain, and the long-running queries, they'll still get done, because maybe they take a little bit longer than they, they would have otherwise. And overall, the system is, is fully utilized. 
So this paper came out in 2021. Again, the reason why I didn't have you guys assign this to read this because it talks about morsels and it assumes you already know morsels. So you had to read, you had to read, you know, read the morsels paper first and understand this. So that's why, that's why I picked the, the morsels paper first. But the guy that wrote this paper uh, gave a talk with us a, uh, I think a year or two ago during the, during the pandemic. Uh, he's since graduated. Um, this was like his master's thesis. And now he's like in charge of query execution team at, at Firebolt which is a OLAP system that's a fork of, of ClickHouse. So, all right, the other thing they're gonna do is they're gonna get rid of that global task queue. And instead, they're gonna rely on thread local storage to keep track of, here's the state of the system. Uh, it's still gonna be a pool-based approach, but the, each thread's gonna have its own local metadata about what the overall state of the system is and the queue is, and it uses that to figure out what the next thing I should go execute. So the way this is going to work is that you're going to have a uh, global task set slot array at the top, uh, and this will be fixed length. I'm showing four, but I think they go up to 128 in the paper. And the idea is like every position in that slot array will tell you here's the task here's the task set for a given query that we can we that we have tasks available for, available for us to execute. And these will just be pointers to this this other task set data structure on the side that has the dependency graph of here's the task sets. Here's the morsels that they, they can operate on, and then here's the, here's the other task sets to depend on the output of these of, of the current task sets, right? So now within every um, within every worker, I have these 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 arrays that basically keep track of here's what's here's what's here's what's changed since the last time I checked. Here's where to go find out what's new, and here's what I'm currently executing. Or here's what's available to execute. So you have this active slot. It's just a bitmap that it says that it corresponds to whether there's a one in uh, meaning that there's the one is set, meaning that the same position in the global array, there is a task set I can go look up and get and find the next task to execute. Right? Then there's be this change mask, which is another bitmap that everybody's gonna have their own version of this, where I set the one to indicate that something has changed in my task set. So whatever sort of whatever metadata you have cached about what's up there, you have to invalidate it and go check again. And then the return bitmap will say, if I complete a task, uh, complete all the, the, if I'm the last thread to complete all the morsels for a given task set, uh, and I've returned the, or I, I've, I've changed what's in here, again, go check to see what, what happened, what, what, what has changed. And all they're doing now, if I, I'll show you an example on the next slide, if I have to update one of these bitmaps, uh, I do a compare and swap on all the bitmaps in every single thread. And they claim that's that's cheaper cheap to do versus like everyone try to having a lot of contention on on a single uh, single global queue, right? So let's see an example here where uh, the a thread completes the completes a task set and has to uh, go get the next task set, put it in the global queue, and then notify the other threads that here's here's what's changed. All right. So say this thread here completes running query one task set one. So it's going to follow the, it knows where it got it from. So it goes up to the global task set. And this is just a, this is just a bunch of list of pointers that then point to the, the, the data structure in this, this task set array or, or hash table. And if it figures out, okay, I've processed all the morsels that are, that, are, that are available for this, then I need to go put the next task set, put that back in the queue. And that's again, just do compare and swap on the array to ensure that nobody else tries to put the same thing in the same, tries to update at the same time I do. And you back off if, if, if there's a collision. But now I need to notify all the other workers that we put a new task set in here. So you know, uh, avoid any, any you know, cash, caching issues. So they just do a compare and swap now on the return mask and all, all the data structures, or there's, there's a return mask in all the different threads and their local storage. Again, compare and swap, that's cheap to do. Uh, you have to go, you know, me have to go across NUMA regions, but it's, uh, it's unavoidable. And then now when this thread says, okay, what's the next thing I should, you know, when it has to say, I'm done my own task, what's the next thing I need to do? It can go check whether there's a change in here. And if yes, then, then it knows, you know, do something like, you know, throw away my cache copy or go follow the pointer, go find uh, what actually has changed, right? Same thing if now, uh, for the, the change mask would be if a, like a new query shows up, you flip the bit and say the change mask for these change masks on all of them. So then now they know that since the last time they checked, 
there's now new an act, act, there's now new, something new in the slot array, and they update my actual slot. So it's just an alternative to the global data structure for the uh, for um, for uh, you know versus the alternative to the global data structure for keeping track of what's in the queue, what's available, and what, who's running what. Um, I'm not showing here also too. There's a notion of priority. So again, every time I go complete something and I update my task set and complete a morsel, I keep track of like every thread has its own local priority for the different tasks that are available. And that way, it's less likely to choose something with a lower priority versus a higher priority. So when it has to figure out what's the next thing I'm going to execute, it's basically flipping a, a weighted coin to figure out which slot should I look at the next task to execute. And over time, this decays. Again, high level overview, just, can, just trying to say it's an alternative. And they fixed a bunch of the issues that were in the first morsels paper. All right, so let's look at a way more complicated scheme uh, than, than the morsels and the umbrella stuff um, in, in HANA. So HANA is an in-memory system out of uh, SAP. SAP is one of the biggest and oldest like, you know, IT or computer software companies in the world. Uh, they make like customer resource management software, ERP software. Like, it's basically, think of like, internal back-end stuff for like, major corporations. They make a lot of money. Um, the, uh, and so HANA was a system they started building as a way to combat Oracle. So, so what I'm saying here is not, not a secret. This is public. SAP software, the main software, for the longest time, only ran on Oracle or Sybase. So they bought Sybase, uh, and then they started making this new thing called HANA to replace Oracle uh, so that you know, Oracle didn't get a cut every single time they, you know, they, they sold the software. Um, the, and then Oracle bought PeopleSoft to fight SAP. Whatever, it's above my pay grade. Um, but anyway, so it's, uh, it's an in-memory system. Uh, it's not used by startups. It's mostly used by you know, big companies, big corporations. But it's, it has a lot of sophisticated and modern in-memory and columnar uh, you know, it's methods, implementations in it, because it's, you know, it's, it's written from scratch in the, in the 2010s. And so this paper here, this is actually was a student project at SAP HANA. So I don't actually know whether it made it to the big rewrite that they did a few years ago. Um, but it was, this was done by a PhD student to build, redo the entire scheduling system in HANA uh, a few years ago to switch it over to, to be something more sophisticated. So this, this is an alternative approach to the morsels. So it's going to be a pull-based scheduler with multiple worker threads. Uh, and then each socket's going to have uh, a pool of workers. And these pool of workers are going to be uh, uh, they're going to be in different modes, and, the, and then the, the data system is, is going to figure out what mode should you be in and what you're waiting for, and then it can increase or decrease the number of active threads or active workers based on, on the demand of the system. So the entire database system is going to run off these worker pools, right? And that includes all the background threads uh, for like garbage collection, networking, anything else, compaction, anything else the data system do has to run off this. In the morsels paper, they had dedicated threads doing garbage collection, dedicated threads doing networking, and the, the morsel scheduling stuff was only for a query execution. In this approach, everything's going to run off uh, the worker pool. Each worker pool is also, or group with a worker pool is going to have um, a soft and high, hard priority queue. We'll see this in a second. But basically, the, the priority queue will determine whether a thread running in a different NUMA region is allowed to steal, steal tasks from that queue. Hard, hard priority means you're not, because I want to run it exactly at, the, at this NUMA region. The soft priority means you can steal it, right? So you would put like garbage collection that's accessing, you know, uh, new, you know, accessing a lot of memory. You want that to be, since that's a heavyweight operation, you want that to be you know, pinned to, to a NUMA region. Same with other sort of networking operations. But again, query tasks, that's OK. We allow that to be steal. And then there's going to be, I wouldn't call this a dispatcher, but there'll be a separate watchdog thread that hovers above everything else, that wakes up every so often, looks at the, uh, the status of these, these, the, the, these thread pools and the thread groups, and can decide whether one is, is overutilized or underutilized, and can switch the, the balance of, of resources on the fly as needed. Right, so a lot of this I've already said. So again, for every, uh, every thread group and within a pool, it's going to have the soft and so every thread group is going to have the soft and hard priority task, and that determines whether 
threads running in all different regions can steal from them. And then with each group, we're going to have four different pools. So the working pool will be, here's the threads that are actually executing some task. Uh, the inactive pool will be the threads that are blocked on some mutex inside the kernel, where I know I can't execute anything. They can't do anything until something wakes them up. Right? They're blocked on something about the database, system, like a lock or on a table or something. The free pool will be uh, basically threads in a busy loop where they're going to sleep for a little bit, wake up, see whether there's something to do in, in, the, in the two, two queues. If not, then go back to sleep. Right? And they're, they're spinning in user land. And the park would be uh, like, a, like in the free pool, it's a thread who's, who's looking for work to do, but rather than doing busy loops and you know, spinning, waking up over, over and again, you, you, you block it on some mutex so it gets descheduled in the kernel uh, and it, it just sleeps down there. Right? And then I can wake it up later on with the watchdog thread. The reason why you want to do something like this is, is uh, this is going to be way cheaper than spawn, having to spawn a thread. Right? To, to go flip a conditional variable and say, hey, wake up, now there's stuff to do, that's cheaper than, than spawn. And then the thread has to go you know, maybe copy some memory and, th and then jump it around and figure out what to do next. So think of this as like an alternative to it having to spawn. All right, so now, uh, depending on whether the database system is going to be CPU bound or memory bound, we can adjust the, the, where threads are running or what threads are running based on what's needed, right? So if I, we find that our database system is entirely CPU bound, instead of memory bound, then we're OK with pen, paying the penalty of having to copy things over NUMA regions because we need, we need the computational resources anyway. Right? But as I said, I've already sort of spoiled this, in the paper they say that in their experiments, when you look at really large machines, like 64 sockets, and they have some customers running at that scale, uh, then work stealing is, is just not as beneficial as just making sure everyone only operates on, on the same new region. Because again, that cross-region, uh, going over the, the, the interconnect between sockets is super expensive. Uh, and it's better off just spinning, waiting for things to free up to actually run. So the SAP would have the, these sort of mini sessions before SIGMOD where they bunch of, invite a bunch of data researchers to come and like, see presentations, talk to their researchers about what they were building in HANA. And they would have HANA customers come in and talk about how they were using HANA. And I, I don't remember which company it was, but they were running on some box. This is like 2019, 2018, where they were running out of address space because uh, it's an in-memory database. And in, 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 in x86, you get 48-bit addresses. Like Even though you get a 64-bit pointer, Intel only uses 48 bits. Their database system was running out of, out of space for 48 bits. Um, it was that large. And they had a ton of these sockets. So th these are pretty massive machines, not anything you can get on, um, on Amazon. Right. So the uh, right. So with these, these thread groups, it's going to allow our tasks to execute uh, other 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 parts of the system, as I said, background tasks, maintenance things. Like Postgres has the log collector, has the the auto vacuum. It's these kind of operational things. For OLAP systems, it's less of an issue because we assume it's read only. Then we're, you know we're not doing compaction like in the Snowflake paper. We're just reading stuff and, and ripping through it. We don't have these additional. Uh, other than networking stuff we, or dispatchers, we don't, have, we don't have additional things we need to schedule. All right, so let's look at an example how this, this would work. Same query as we had before. We have a bunch of tasks. We know the dependency between the pipelines. And then for here, we just have you know, two garbage collection tasks on, on table B. So the, the first task we want to execute, we'll just put all of these in, in the soft queue. And then the, the, the well, threads can wake up and go, go take things from here, right? For the garbage collection stuff, we want to only run on local memory uh, within our NUMA region, so we'll put these in the hard queue, and this will prevent anybody from stealing that. So now our working threads uh, can wake up, and they go, go pull things out of the soft queue, and they can start running. Uh, for these other threads here, the inactive ones, they're waiting on some latch or you know, some mutex that, that uh, is blocking it from you know, executing anything. So we, we, we can't execute anything there. Not so much an issue for, um, not so much an issue for, uh, for OLAP systems because we're not doing transactions. So actually, latch is a bad example because you would spin on that. But it, like it, if I want to get a lock on a table, I, you know, I can't run until something wakes me up and says I can do that. So I, I'm, I'm stuck on that. 
Free is the one we're doing, you know, user space, busy loops, looking for stuff to do. And the parks is where, where we're down in the kernel and, and we're sleeping. So the, the free threads will wake up and it'll, it'll look in these queues and say this first guy finds something in the hard queue. So then it, and it changes into the, the working pool and it can execute. Question or no? So, right, the, what, is, what does this look like? An operating system, right? <laughs> like, because again, we don't want to use, I'm not picking on Linux, but like, we don't want to let the operating system figure this out because it's not going to know the dependencies between, you know, that this thing's waiting for some kind of logical construct, a logical lock, right? It doesn't, it's not going to know that, uh, that based on what the queries I have showing up in my pipeline or my, my, my queue coming up, that I want to maybe scale down within one, you know, one socket, the number of working threads, and increase on in another one. Yes? I would be surprised if Linux didn't have like binary control for this. So is there like a difference between using like aforementioned fine grain control through like an actual OS versus rewriting the OS besides additional overhead? All right, your statement is uh, Linux has the ability to have fine grain control of what threads are doing, yes? Uh, so what's the advantage of writing this all ourselves versus let Linux do it? Yeah. Um, because Linux doesn't know what the queries are, like doesn't know the tasks ahead of us, right? Okay. It doesn't know that like, okay, this, you know, this thing's going to execute, it's going to read this data from this region and write it to this location. Mm -hmm. We can do that because it's SQL and it's declared and we know exactly what's, what's coming along. Okay. So we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a better position to make better decisions about what the right thing to do is. Now. Would I go this far and have like this, all these different pools of exactly what they're having? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. But they, they argue uh, you would. Yes? I think there are two questions. First one was if you're saying that uh, they have thread level fine grain support, all you need is just a thread manager on top, right? Uh, so someone who can basically instruct with the dependencies map up, right? That's the only contention that you have. There's going to be issue with this. From so using an OS. So, so you're saying you, so you, you have a thread manager that uh, gives tasks to the thread. Or the thread can come to the versus like putting them to sleep in themselves and things like that. Yeah, that is okay. Way. You don't have to implement all of the thread logic by itself because the OS thread logic is there. So that was the first question. That, that's more of a statement than a question, right? Like, I mean, yeah. So basically, yeah. you said that uh, you need to. I, 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 so, I mean, I actually think this might be an overkill, right? And I, I don't know whether they actually implemented this in. in the, the newer version of HANA or not. Okay. Like I said, there's, there's a, somebody's there's PhD dissertation to build this. I'm just showing this as an, alter, like, an alternative to, Han, to, to Hyper's Morsel stuff. Uh, maybe think of this. There's, there's Postgres, we just let the OS do whatever it wants, yeah. right? And then there's this HANA thing where like, it's really fine grained control of like, deciding who goes to sleep when and when to wake up and so forth. And then, then deciding how to, what threads to turn off and what threads to spin up on the different sockets. Right? So that, I would think that's the two extremes. The morsels one, I would say, is somewhere in the middle. And since data sources are again uh, shared, right? So there's going to be some contention. Or say statement is the data structures are shared. Like this is this would be this is shared within a okay. like a socket. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So but there was, um, the contention will be that then. Uh, yeah. So like say there's like eight eight threads per socket. Just an atomic yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, this is local to the socket. Every, every thread group is going to have, think of one thread group equals one socket. Every thread group has these much queues. Another thread, another th uh, thread group can go poke in here and figure that out, go, go look in there. Uh, and that's why, again, they were saying the work stealing didn't work out because the cost of going to interconnect and the cache invalidation of these, these, sort of these, these shared data structures becomes a problem. Okay. So in the last five minutes, I want to talk about SQL OS. Uh, so what's that? What's wrong? It's just, OK, it's just funny. The name is funny. This thing's awesome. This is like one of the best things part of SQL Server. <laughs> this is like one of my favorite parts. It's also what? It's potentially overkill. <laughs> I disagree. OK. All right, so SQL OS is a, 
so it's a, it's a NUMA aware user space abstraction layer above the operating system that runs inside the SQL Server that manages all the, the access to the hardware resources, like CPU, disk, and memory. So right? Be the OS? Of course, yeah. Again, we don't, <laughs> we don't want to use the operating system. I see. Right? So the reason why they built this was because they found that every single time new hardware came out, in particular, actually, because of NUMA, I think was the, the, the catalyst for building this, every time new hardware came out uh, that had maybe slightly different properties than the previous hardware, Microsoft found themselves having to go back and actually change the physical operator implementations in the data system over and over again. All right, and they said, okay, well, this is, is there a way to abstract away the, the operating system so that we don't have to do that every single time? So like, if we want to start running on GPUs or FPGAs, right, that we don't have to go rewrite everything uh, all over again. So the idea is that they're going to have the single interface that's going to support uh, parallel operations that are aware of the location of data and can, can extract away maybe the low-level details of where things are actually located, or in terms of the implementation of the operator itself, right? The other cool thing that they did with this is that they switched to be uh, non-preemptive thread scheduling, meaning they're basically using coroutines before languages support these things directly. Um, and they're going to use cooperative scheduling so that threads can just uh, if they don't have any work to do or they're blocked on something, they yield back to the SQL scheduler, who then can decide what's the next thing to run. Right? So what's really awesome about this, this came out in 2000, I think they started in 2006. In 2017, Microsoft announced that SQL Server now runs on Linux. Right? <laughs> I don't see why that's funny, but... <laughs> uh, why is it sad for me? I don't know. This thing's amazing. Why? Why? Why was? Why would this be sad? Because it's like supposed to replace the OS, but now it's working with the OS. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. So when like in this article, it wasn't the entire the reason why like like SQLS wasn't. They didn't rip out SQLS. SQLS made it so they could port it to Linux fairly easily without having to rewrite everything, because because all the Win32 stuff that, that that was specific to Windows. Uh, all that is hidden below SQL OS. The upper parts of the system don't need, don't, don't care. Like, what, what's the syscall to go read data? SQL OS hit all of that. So all they had to do was, was replace the, the Windows-specific code in SQL OS with the Linux-specific code, and they were report it to, to Linux. This is, this is fascinating. This is, this is amazing. This is a triumph, <laughs> right? Um, so, and they, they did this port in 2017, uh, but like, again, SQL OS was written in 2006. Like, this is fantastic because they, 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 they added SQL OS to solve one problem, but they didn't solve a major problem later on. Um, and as I said before, I think I said this in the, in the um, when we did the Q&A session at the intro class, someone asked me what my favorite, why do I think SQL Server is amazing? I think it's this plus the Freud stuff, although uh, Sam has some problems with that later on, but like, we'll cover a bunch of the things that SQL Server does that I think is really interesting. All right, so the way they're going to do coroutines and scheduling is that they're going to have these uh, four millisecond quantums. But because we're doing non-preemptive thread scheduling, the, 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 the database system or SQL OS layer can't enforce that. Like it can't, thread can't run, and, and it can't come in and say, oh, hey, stop running. I'm taking back your, 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 you know, your core, and I'm giving it to another thread. That's what the, that's what the operating system does. And we, but we can't, we can't put that interrupt in. So the way we, this has to work is that we have to modify the, the, the database system itself, the actual code for the, ex, the execution engine, to introduce these different barriers or checkpoints where we decide, OK, have I run long enough? If yes, yield back to the scheduler so it can run something else for me. So say I have a really simple query here, select star from A, where r dot value, r dot value equals something. So an approximate query plan would just be iterate over, over r, about my predicate and admit it, right? Nothing fancy there. So with this non preemptive scheduling, what you have is you basically keep track of the timestamp of when you started and the last time you checked. And then if, if the, the amount of time you've run inside this for loop has gone past your allowed quantum, like four, four milliseconds, then you yield back to the scheduler so it can run something else. Yes? Uh, what kind of overhead does this put? Like, for each tool you're going to put? Or is this just like a layman implementation? This, this, yeah, this is, this is like, 
just, just illustration purposes. You wouldn't actually do it. I hope you wouldn't do it this, this way, right? Because um, calling, you know, this is not cheap, right? Uh, so, right, so again, so the, the uh, we're doing four millisecond quantums, and then the idea here is that, like, say, my example here, it's based on time, but say I also then try to get a, uh, a lock for something, and I can't, at that point, I, I just yield back to the SQL OS layer and say, oh, I'm waiting for this lock. Don't schedule me again until I, I get it. Again, that's a high-level construct that the, because that the, we don't want to use mutexes for our, our locks. It's a high-level logical lock or, or protection mechanism that the, the operating system doesn't know about. So instead of us scheduling, waking up, seeing, oh, we don't have the thing we need, go back to sleep, we know the SQL OS schedule will not schedule us. His statement is, why not use interrupts and then have special additional code to, to handle those interrupts? Yeah, I mean, so basically, with this, you have to modify all the existing code to have the unique statements inside this. Yes. Whereas an interrupt, you can just send an interrupt, and it has to have an interrupt handler. The work has to have an interrupt handler, which when it receives some specific user something. But the pro so, so his statement is, why not just use interrupts, and then, he, of course, every thread has to have an interrupt handler. But the problem is, if the interrupt shows up, where are you in the code? It doesn't matter. If I'm holding a latch on something, I get interrupted and I get swapped out, but I hold the latch. So for latches and locks, you can have a special I, I mean, I say that's way harder than this. Like I'm, I'm scanning a B plus tree, I, I, get the, I get the interrupt, and I gotta got go on, figure out what, I, what latches I hold in my B plus tree, unlatch those, and then pop back out. I think it's way harder than this. Wait, so when you are in a latch, when you take a latch, you do inform someone that you're taking a latch? Nope. Latches are compare and swap. Yeah, and lock is lock is a high level concept. Latch is like a low level data structure thing. Yeah. So uh, I only know uh, four systems that do something like this. SQL OS is probably the most famous one. Uh, we're over time. Sorry, let me finish up. Uh, Celia DB uh, is a bit, uh, they have they gave a talk a few years ago. They had their own uh, scheduler in, in this thing called C Star. Uh, this is probably the, the most sophisticated open source implementation I've seen. Uh, the uh, FaunaDB does a poor man's implementation of this. Basically, anytime you do, you're going to read something from disk, they just yield back. I think that's the only part where they actually do this. Uh, it's based on like Windows 95 uh, non preemptive scheduling from the 90s. And then CoroBase is an academic system out of Simon Fraser, where this is designed entirely for uh, doing coroutines. Okay, so in the sake of time, um, let me just jump to the end. Oh, well, flow control is pretty, pretty obvious. Um, basically, a bunch of, bunch of queries show up, you get overwhelmed, how do you prevent that? The easiest thing to do is just crash, but that's obviously bad, <laughs> right? Uh, so the two approaches to do emission control, basically when requests show up and you, can't, you don't want to take any more, you abort them, you deny the request. Uh, Throttling is just when you, uh, you maybe get the result for the um, for a user, but you just delay the, the response back, say, hey, here it is. Because you don't want them coming back immediately send, send another query. So typically what you want to do is sort of a combination of, of these two things. And this one only works too when you know someone's running in a tight loop, right? So typically you just do this. You, say, you deny new queries to show up. The Umbra paper says you put things in, in, a, in a queue on the side. But again, those network threads aren't cheap. They maintain uh, state. Depending how you're doing transactions, you may have to go check every single network thread to see whether, look, look at their rewrite sets. And so having a lot of network connections could be a bad idea. Postgres it is. Um, but typically, the first one is the way to go. All right, so just to finish up. So today, we ignore disk IO scheduling. Uh, the, but like I said, that's just, a, you, know, you, know, you know when you need to execute, you go ahead and dispatch it asynchronously. Um, we can talk about IO you ring and, and asynchronous IO and, uh, later on. But the main thing I want you to get away from this, from this talk and discussion is that, again, the database system is super important. We don't want the operating system to do anything for us as much as possible. Uh, so that means we, we want to do all our memory allocations, all our task scheduling, everything ourselves. Don't let the operating system touch it because it's, it's, it's going to have problems. It's going to make our lives terrible. Okay. All right, so next class we'll talk about vectorized execution. Uh, there's, there's another paper from the Germans. You can skip the GIS stuff at the end. Just focus on like, how you're actually doing the, the, you know, the scans and the hash table stuff. That's more important. Okay? <laughs>
<laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the SP Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cup say so I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a flow to the eyes, yo. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park, and South Central, G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12-pack case of the 40. A six-pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>